it was hot. I mean, stifling hot and bone dry. He hadn't smelled rain for six months, and he hadn't seen the sun for over nine. The limestone walls of his cell were the same as the walls of the palace above, but man, it looks different in the dark of a dungeon. He has been alone with his thoughts for nine months. He's not wrestling with a a general pop prison with all this chaos. It's actually worse because when you're alone, what attacks you is your own thoughts. Like, why am I here? What could I have done differently? What, what What did I do wrong? John has been in prison for nine months. Not John the great apostle, but the great John before him, the baptizer. You know, that, that fiery-eyed, wild-haired, crazy, loud-mouthed preacher in the desert, John the Baptist. He's been preaching about righteousness and repentance to every level of government, the common people, the priests, the Roman government, Pontius Pilate. He's, he's, he's preaching against all of them. But the one he really attacked was Herod Agrippa. He has been now in a dungeon for nine months, and he's beginning to doubt, which is amazing because John the Baptist knew who Jesus was. He actually was the one that pointed to Jesus and told the crowds, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He told his own followers, don't follow me, follow him. He's the Messiah. John has known who Jesus was since he was born. His mother, Elizabeth, while he was still in her womb, had a visit from Mary, the mother of Jesus, just barely pregnant, and the story was told to John. When you met Jesus in the womb, you actually skipped. He knew about the virgin birth. He knew about the ancient prophecies of Messiah. He knew who Jesus was, and yet, after nine months, when the walls of a dungeon close in on you, it can squeeze doubt out of you. Now, all of us have been there. All of us have had our own dungeon of doubt. I know that I have. I I know who God is. And on my good days, when life is good, God is good, Jesus is real. No problem. But when life takes a left turn, that's when the walls begin to squeeze in and it squeezes doubt out of you. And I begin to question, Jesus, are you really who they say you are? Because it looks to me like you're not doing what you said you were going to do. And isn't that the pinch of doubt? That when you have an expectation that is unmet, God, you're supposed to be good. God, you're supposed to protect me. God, you're supposed to love me. And when you doubt, it's because God hasn't met your expectation. Now look, your dungeon of doubt is going to be different than mine. We all have our own. For, for many, the dungeon of doubt is being childless. You want kids so bad, but you're part of the 20% that can't have kids, and you just wonder why. The questions begin to leach out as the walls press in on you. For some of you, your your dungeon of doubt is not the kids you don't have, it's the kids you do have. (laughs) Why why is my kid addicted? Why, why Why is my kid struggling with a disability. And for some, it's, why did I have to bury my child? It's so unnatural. And then some of the dungeon of doubt is not about your kids, it's about your parents. Nobody should ever have to treat a mom or a dad like a child, but most do at some point. And you go through this dungeon of doubt. It could be business, it could be a lover that left you, a friend that abandoned you. We all have different walls in our dungeon of doubt. But when the walls squeeze in, they can press doubt out of you. Look, it's natural. And if you don't hear anything else in this message, please hear me say this. And this is the text that we're going to be in. Matthew 11 It's going to teach this about John the Baptist. That when you doubt Jesus, he doesn't doubt you back. He still believes in you. And maybe maybe you're a Christian today and you think, well, I can't be a very good Christian because I have these doubts. No, no. 
it's time that you doubt your doubt. Because Jesus has never doubted you and your value. And some of you actually are watching online because you don't want to come to a church just yet because you're not sure what this is all about. You have your doubts. That's okay. Doubters are welcome here. Some of you are post-Christians, not pre-Christians. You, like you used to believe. But because of so many unanswered questions, you just wonder if, if the faith that you do have can bear up under the weight of the doubt that's on top of it. That's why I think this story is so important for us to talk about, because we all have doubts, and we want to look at a story where John the Baptist, one of the greatest men ever born, had his doubts. And maybe you can relate to his story. It's in Matthew chapter 11. If you have a Bible, feel free to follow along. Matthew is the first book in the second half of the Bible. It's called the New Testament. In chapter 11, I want to set the scene so we understand what we're digging into here. We have to understand why John is in prison and where John is. The, the where is actually easy. He's in a place called Machaerus. It was a fortress in the middle of the Judean desert. In fact, you can climb up the mountain even today and see the hill where the palace was. You can walk all the way around on the top. You see this flat area on top, and if you were to go to the top, you would see the foundations of the palace that Herod had built. Now, in this palace, if you look across the Dead Sea, you are looking right at a community called Qumran. It's just an archaeological site today, but back in the day, it was a vibrant site of monastics. They were Jewish leaders that got so angry with the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, the high priests and the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, that they left Jerusalem and prayed for God to destroy their own government so that they could come in and rebuild it in purity. Now, that's the Qumran community. You might recognize their name because of the Qumran scrolls or the Dead Sea Scrolls. The greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century 1947, a little Bedouin shepherd boy throws a rock into the cave and he hears a jar break. And he goes to investigate and he finds these scrolls that have been hidden away for 2,000 years. More on that in a moment. That's where John is. Why is he there? Well, because he had the audacity to preach against Herod. Not Herod the Great who tried to kill Jesus as an infant. No, this is his son, Herod the Great's son, Herod Antipas. He's the one who will see Jesus at his trial before he's crucified just a few months from now. Herod Antipas, he had a lust for power. And he was married to a princess. Don't be too impressed. She wasn't like an important princess. Her father was a king of a small petty kingdom right next door to the Jews. And, and, and Herod, he wanted more power, so he kept making these trips to Rome. And as he goes to Rome, he's asking the emperor, give me more territory, give me more power, give me higher titles. And on one of these trips, he stayed with his brother Philip. It was a half-brother. Philip, a little naughty, he married his niece. She was from a very important Jewish family. Her name was Herodias. And I think the technical term for Herodias is, um, what is it, a, a hottie. And when Herod saw Herodias, he seduced her. And then he said, hey, I got an idea. Why don't you divorce your husband? I'll divorce my wife. We will marry each other. Now that's bad enough, right? It gets worse. They didn't leave their spouses because they loved each other. They didn't even leave their spouses because they lusted for each other. They left their spouses because they lusted for power. And the alliance of Herodias from an important Jewish family and Herod, the most important of the Herod dynasty, they would have greater power together. Now, how do you think John the Baptist is going to respond to that? He's a guy that preaches about righteousness, and if you're not righteous, he preaches about repentance. He went ballistic against Herod. And Herod probably would have overlooked it. 
Except that John the Baptist has thousands of people coming out to him in the wilderness to be baptized by him. Now, in that day, and actually to this day, great crowds in the Middle East, in the desert, might be a terrorist event. And so Herod has an excuse to arrest John the Baptist, but it's really Herodias that prompted him. I hate him, I hate him, I hate him, arrest him. And so he did what his wife wanted. You know what they say, hell hath no fury. And she was looking for a way of getting rid of John, like killing him. And she found her excuse at a party. It was Herod's birthday party, and from the basement, the dungeon below, John can hear all the revelry, the, the political power brokers, the, the, the wealthy businessmen, the pornographic entertainments of the party. And in the middle of that, Herodias had a daughter. It went, not with Herod, but actually with Herod's brother, Philip. He was a stepdaughter to Herod. And she was probably 12, 13 years old. Had the body of a woman and the mind of a girl. And her mother said, hey, sweetie, I want you to go in and dance for those men. This was not line dancing. It was a lewd dance for these lecherous old men. And apparently she's pretty good. Because Herod, let's just say he was inspired. And he made this rash promise in his drunken state, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. And so she runs to her mama and says, mama, what should I ask for? And she said, you ask him for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. When she told that to Herod, he sobered up in a heartbeat. But because of his pride, he gave her what she asked for, not to lose face in front of all his friends. And that's how John the Baptist lost his head. Well, that's not yet. That's a few weeks out. But he sees the headlight of that train coming full force. And he still has some of his disciples who are coming to visit him in prison, which I don't know why they're coming to visit John. John told them, go follow Jesus. He's the Messiah. If I were to guess, I would guess that these disciples of John did not follow Jesus because they didn't like Jesus, because Jesus wasn't like them. You probably know how that works. John the Baptist, he did not drink alcohol. Jesus, well, he had a reputation of going to drinking parties. John the Baptist, he preached against sexual immorality, and Jesus was hanging around with prostitutes. John the Baptist was against the corruption of government. I mean, at every level of government, there was corruption, from the Romans to the Jews to the high priest. Not that we could relate to that. If you were to stand John the Baptist, Jesus, and Herod Antipas right next to each other, Jesus would actually look a little bit more like Herod than John. Because Jesus... He is going to drinking party. He is hanging around with tax collectors and sinners. And worst of all, worst of all for John, one of the descriptions of Messiah in the Bible is that he would release prisoners, Isaiah 61. In fact, Jesus knew the prophecy. He had preached that very text in his very first sermon in Nazareth. He he quoted Isaiah 61, and I will release prisoners. And John's going, all right, if you're going to release prisoners, how about right here? How about right now? How about me? That's part of the problem with John, is he's looking at Jesus on paper, and he's not understanding Jesus, the person. I think that's where all of us are in our dungeon of doubt. Isn't that why you doubt? It's because you think that you've read, this is what Jesus is supposed to do. And on paper, this is who he's supposed to be. And when he doesn't meet your expectations, that's when the walls of your dungeon of doubt squeeze doubt out of you. So John sends a delegation to Jesus to ask this question. And and here's his question, Matthew 11, verse 3. Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? See, like your doubt, it begins with a simple question, why? And if the question goes unanswered, 
It becomes a quotation. But you said. And, and, and if, if there's no change, the question that becomes a quotation moves to an accusation. And it sounds like a question, but really what John is saying is the Bible says Messiah is supposed to release prisoners, but you're not releasing prisoners. So can I really count on you to be the Messiah? That's where I am in my dungeon of doubt. I suspect you can relate to that. Here's Jesus' response. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Press pause. Jesus is actually quoting from two chapters of one book. This is important. Isaiah is the book, Isaiah 35, Isaiah 61. Each of them give certain descriptions of the Messiah. This is what he's going to do. And, and all of these come out of Isaiah 35 or Isaiah 61, except for one phrase. This sentence, this phrase that says, the dead are raised, that is not in Isaiah 35. That is not in Isaiah 61. So why did Jesus add to what the Bible says? Well, I mean, anyone who can walk on water can do that, I suppose. But it's not actually Jesus who added it. You know who added it? You remember a moment ago, I was talking about the Qumran community and the scrolls they found. Most of the scrolls came out of Cave 4. Now you can see behind me a picture of Cave 4 in the Qumran community. That's what John would see as he looked out of his prison cell window across the Dead Sea. That's Cave 4. And inside Cave 4 was a manuscript. I want to show you a picture of the manuscript. This is what it actually looks like. It's kind of tattered, but if you read the lines that are still there, you find a description quoting in this document, quoting Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61. The same chapters that Jesus quotes. And there's a sentence in this document that is not in the Bible. They added this phrase that said, the dead are raised. Is that incredible? Jesus isn't merely quoting the Bible. He is quoting the Qumran scroll. The quoted from Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61 and added, he included the addition of the Qumran community. Here's what I think is going on. John, who preached his whole ministry in the shadow of Qumran, I'm convinced along with a number of scholars that Jesus, or that John the Baptist was probably at one point part of the Qumran community. He knew their people, he knew their ideas, and he knew their documents. And I think John Jesus is saying to John, John, I know exactly where you are. You think I'm not paying attention. I know exactly where you are. And I know what you're going through. And the crux of it all, if you read the descriptions of what Jesus just said, you know the one line he left out of Isaiah 61? That he'll release prisoners. And if you listen carefully, you can hear Jesus across 2,000 years, not just speak to John, but to you. I will release prisoners. I will release thousands of prisoners, but right here, not you. Not because I don't know where you are, and not because I don't care about what you're going through. It's because I have something better for you. John, I'm not gonna release you from prison. I am going to raise you from the dead. When you doubt Jesus, it's not because he has not met your expectations. It's because your expectations are not high enough for what he wants to do for you, in you, and through you. And you might think that because you doubt Jesus, he would doubt you. He doesn't. In fact, as John's disciples walk away, 
Jesus turns to the crowd. You've got to eavesdrop on this moment because he does the exact same thing with you. You think he's disappointed in you. He is not. Listen to what he says about John the Baptist. Verse 7. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? (laughs) That's not John. No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. And more than a prophet, this is, about, this is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Jesus is reminding them that John the Baptist was predicted in ancient scriptures. There's not a, a greater honor than that for God to predict you in the Bible. Can you imagine that you would be predicted in the Bible? And then listen to what he says about John. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. That's odd to me. Because if you look through the Old Testament, there were some powerful people. Like King David killed a giant. You know how many battles that John the Baptist won? Zero. Moses led the people out of Egypt. You know how many people that John led out of Egypt? None. In fact, Moses gave us not just the Ten Commandments, but the first five books of the Bible. You know how many books that John wrote? None. Elisha, Elijah, great prophets. They rose people from the dead. You know how many people, how many miracles that John did? None. If John didn't write any books, do any miracles, lead any kingdoms, then why is he the greatest man ever born of a woman? Here's why. Don't miss this. It was his proximity to Jesus that made him great. It's not his accomplishments. It was his proximity to Jesus that made him great. And because he was near to Jesus, he could point others to Jesus. This shouldn't come as a great surprise to you, that your value is not in what you do, but in whose you are. Because that's the way we treat our own children. Your children may not have won as many awards as someone next door. They they may not be as good as athletes as someone down the street. They may not make as much money as someone in a different town. But your children are more important to you because they are closer to you. God's kingdom is a family. And when you come into the family, it's not your performance that makes you great, it's your connection that makes you great. Because the closer connection you have to Jesus, the more able you are to point other people to Jesus. That's why John the Baptist was greater than any man ever born of a woman. Now, what I'm about to say to you, I've got to read it or you'll think I'm a liar. I was doing a training this week with a group of pastors, and in the room was a, was a woman, who part of a pretty large church, and she was over all of the Christian education for students, middle school, kids, down to kindergarten. So she had a lot of responsibility to know the Bible and teach the Bible. So I asked the question, it's a simple question, are you greater than John the Baptist? In a blink of an eye, she said, no, 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 I'm not. And you probably agree with her. Now, I'm not greater than John the Baptist because I've never done a miracle. Well, neither did he. I've never written a book. Well, neither did he. I've never won a battle. Well, neither did he. What made John the Baptist great? His proximity to Jesus. Because the closer you are to Jesus, the more able you are to point other people to Jesus. And in a family, that's what wins the day. Listen to the to to verse 11. This is the last half. Jesus says, yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Why? Because if you're in the kingdom of heaven, you are closer to Jesus than John. And that may not make sense to you because you weren't a relative of John and you didn't walk with Jesus. How could you possibly be closer to Jesus than John? Paul answers that question, Ephesians 1, verse 13. Again, that's Ephesians 1, verse 13. In Christ, 
when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. When you give your heart to Jesus, he puts his spirit in your heart. And the Holy Spirit in you makes you closer to Jesus than anyone in the Old Testament. King David did not have the Holy Spirit in his heart. He looked forward to the day Messiah would come. But until Messiah died for our sins and rose again from the dead, no one had the intimate connection to God the Father through the Holy Spirit because of the sacrifice of the Son. No one. Not David, not Abraham, not Moses, not Noah, not Elijah, not Isaiah. And you might not feel that you're great, but in God's eyes you are. You know why? Because your proximity to Jesus allows you the capability, even more than John the Baptist, to tell people about Jesus, to move him from a piece of paper to a person, and that's what makes you great. And I swear to you, when you get to heaven, if you see Moses and go, oh, dude, I want to talk to Moses, you walk up to Moses and go, Moses, what was it like to raise your staff and, 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 and depart the sea? You walk through on dry ground, what was that like? He would look at you with bewilderment, why do you want to know about that? That's a parlor trick compared to what you got to do. When you brought someone to Easter and they got baptized, you parted the water of baptism and they went through a totally transformed person. That's what I want to know about. And you see David and you go, oh, David, what was it like? I mean, Goliath with the big guy, big fall, what was that like? He's going, are you kidding me? He was just a big old ogre. I hit him with a rock. It's not that big a deal. What I want to know is when you prayed over your friend and they were struggling with an addiction and you prayed the name of Jesus over them because the Jesus in you leeches out as you brag about Jesus, the person addicted, there was actually a spiritual warfare that you never saw. There were demons far fiercer than Goliath and they ran from you. Because you use the name of Jesus Christ. I want to know what that's like. David is so jealous of you. <laughs> Moses, jealous of you. Elisha, you ask Elijah, what was it like to raise the widow's son from the dead? You know what he say? The boy died later. <laughs> I want to know what it's like to bring someone to Christ so that they never die. Do you understand the power you have because of your proximity to Jesus? You may doubt Jesus. He has never doubted you. So maybe it's time for you to doubt your doubt. If you think about John the Baptist, his dungeon was not limestone walls. It was the thoughts in his own mind. And he always had the key in his hand to get out of the dungeon that he was in. And so do you. So do you. You have the key to unlock the door to your dungeon. And the key has always been pointing to Jesus and saying to others, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And if Jesus doesn't meet your expectations, it's because he plans on exceeding your expectations. And so, my challenge to you is really simple. And, and maybe, you're, maybe you're a pre-Christian. You don't even believe in Jesus yet. You have your doubts. I'll tell you how to overcome your doubts and get out of the dungeon of doubt. Or you're a post-Christian. You've deconstructed your faith because of the challenges of the last few years. And you think, I'm not sure I can believe in Jesus anymore. Look, here's what we know. And we know that we know this. What you focus on most will grow the quickest. And if you focus on your doubt, it's going to grow. If you focus on your faith, it's going to grow. So my challenge to you is to focus on what you know about Jesus. There's some things that you know. Like, even if you don't believe in Jesus, you know that he fought for the protection of widows and orphans. You know that. You know that he was compassionate to the poor and the marginalized. You know that. You know that he sacrificed his life for others. You know that. You know that he said, pray for your enemies and take care of your neighbors. You know that. 
That's a lot that's worth bragging about. And when you begin to brag about Jesus, even in the smallest way, that faith of a mustard seed can grow. And what you know right now will bear the weight of every doubt you will ever have. Look, Jesus isn't going to answer all your questions. Like, who even imagined that he was supposed to answer all your questions? Why do you expect that? There will always be open questions. There will always be unclarity, and there will always be pain in your life. But if you focus on what you know, that will grow to a foundation worth building your life upon. And so the challenge is simple. Here it is. This week, tell one person that you care about one thing that's worth bragging about, about Jesus. We call that sharing our faith. It's one of our main next steps. And if you go on the app and you look at our next steps, sharing will be there. And if you click the button, there's all these resources of how to share your faith with others. But look, don't, don't overcomplicate this. You don't have to preach a sermon. <laughs> you don't have to answer every question. You don't even have to win the debate. Here's all you have to do. This week, tell one person one thing that makes you proud to be a disciple of Jesus. And if you do, I can promise you this. Jesus will not meet your expectations. He will exceed them. Let's pray. Holy Father, I do pray as we rush towards Easter that the family here would talk about you with their friends and family to say one thing to one person this week that we're proud about you. And that's not hard to do because there is so much. Even in our doubt, there's so much that we're proud about. So Jesus, I confess to you in front of my family my own doubts, and I promise to you this week I will doubt my doubt by telling someone else what I know to be true about you. It's in the holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's go out and make Jesus famous.